Today on the Bumper to Bumper Roadmap, why do I fail emissions? Remove, disassemble, and inspect, uh, commonly known as RDI. And Dave, your face is turning red, and I know this is a <laughs> subject we're going to get salivating. We're going to get fired up and maybe get in trouble. <laughs> Probably so. Know. You know, you guys wonder how we come up with show topics. It's just things that happen in our shop every week that gives us show topic content. Or, of course, your emails, we get that as well. And Jill said, how not to get swindled by the auto shop. And I told her bamboozled. I don't know where she got swindled. <laughs> I like bamboozled better myself. But, you know, you won't hear Matt and I often talk about uh, bad auto shop practices because we want to... We want to clear up some of the negativity. There's a lot of good guys in the automotive business, a lot of people really trying to do an honest job, and there's a few bad seeds. And today I want to talk about a bad seed. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's also a lot of confused customers that don't know any better mm -hmm. or the right questions to ask, but we'll, we'll move on to that through our, maybe what is our rant here. Through our rant here. Well, I ha I've had two vehicles in my shop in the last two weeks that these people had transmission issues, so they went to the biggest name in transmissions that's been around for, I don't know, decades, since the 50s, I think, and uh, they went in there and they said, here's my car, here's the transmission issue I'm having, and I'm going to talk about one of them specifically. It was a 2005 Volkswagen. Maybe not even a transmission, it's just a problem, because after problem. all, they fix everything now. Yeah, they're not specialists anymore, they do, they do complete car care. But 2005 Volkswagen, and uh, they went in there with some shifting, some idiosyncrasies. It wasn't shifting right. And they said, we're going to, uh, what we need to do, we've checked your car out. We definitely feel your symptoms. We're going to need to remove the transmission from the car in order to find out what's wrong with the transmission. That's, and it's that's gonna be, the first part of R, That's RDI, step, yeah. Yeah, remove, right? That's step one, and that's going to cost you $400, but at least we'll be able to get in there and see what's wrong with it. And they say, we have to do that. It only makes sense. We've got to take it apart. And it, it does make sense. Well, yeah, you've got to take it apart and see what's wrong. It's not true. But, and, but time out then. It doesn't always register with the person that's saying, oh, $400 to find out what's wrong? Sounds reasonable. They don't realize that $400, once you, once you have a $400 bill, now you need a tow truck to get your car out if you don't want right. to have the fix. So it's now you have a basket. Okay. Well, this this person did ask some decent questions, and, and you had to have to ask good questions. They said, "Well, well, what's what's the next step after we spend four hundred dollars?" Well, it could be twenty five hundred dollars to to fix your transmission if it's a soft parts overhaul, and that's what that's the terminology they like to use is soft parts overhaul. There's no such thing as a soft parts overhaul. I'm here to tell you folks. So they got their transmission out and they took it apart and they said, "Oh, this drum is bad, and that's bad, and this is bad." Wow, it's a lot worse than we thought it was going to be. <laughs> it's going to be forty nine hundred dollars. Forty nine hundred dollars. I thought it was just going to be four hundred dollars. You know, or twenty five, or twenty five, or twenty five hundred dollars. No, yours is in worse shape. Probably one of the worst ones we've seen. And uh, you know, that's where that's where a sticking point. They knew long before they took this car apart that does this transmission need a full rebuild? And a good job would be forty nine hundred dollars. Well, it's 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 deceptive. It's very deceptive. It, it, it's, it's, it's trickery. It's, it's bull -oni, and there's another word I could have used. Those guys, <laughs> as big as they are and as nationwide as they are, they know damn well how much that transmission could have cost. Oh, absolutely. And if they would have said what it could have cost, the guy wouldn't have said, go ahead with the $400. Here's the thing that makes me, makes me matter than all of that, because they say we've got to take it out to find out what's wrong. You take it out of the car, you no longer have the dyno, the way to test the transmission. But what was wrong with that transmission, when I read the symptoms that they went in with, it's an 09G transmission. They're vanilla. We work on them all the time. There's a bulletin from Volkswagen for bad valve bodies, or valve bodies worn out prematurely. They even extended the warranty up to 100,000 miles. It was such common knowledge in the business. And when I read the symptoms, that's all they needed. Well, the valve body still was an expensive repair. A valve body could be $1,900, yeah, $2,100, but as compared to $5,000, I certainly would pick that option. I don't know about you. It's a good transmission. It's built for 200,000 miles, but it has a valve body issue. Well, it's like the other deal we talked about with the other transmission. Yeah, transmission will fix it, but it didn't need that much to fix it. That's That's the... So I guess the takeaway here on this thing is when you go to a shop, and there is instances where we don't know what the cost is going to be. There is a couple occasions, a couple situations, so we can't make just a blanket statement. But 
on the transmission aspect, Especially the other way is as common as those are. As common but as those are. I, I can understand in some cases, you know, people want to know what the worst case is. And I'll, we always go back to the medical analogies. If you go have to go have surgery on your toe, you're signing the same documents that you're going to have heart surgery. You might die from the anesthesia. It's possible. That's the worst case. How many people would stop having their little toenail fixed under anesthesia if they thought they were going to, they could die? So people ask, what's the worst case? Well, I guess the worst case is you need a computer, you need all new fuel injectors, you need, but that's not very likely either. Right. We, we can get you. Well, I told you there was the there, worst case, or what is likely to be the worst case. We can we can play out the scenario with a lot better accuracy than that. I mean, and the the other one I had in my shop was a was a uh, Chevrolet Blazer with a 4L60 transmission in it. That thing is in Camaros. That thing is in Tahoes. That thing is in BMWs. It's it's in all kinds of cars. I mean, it's all over the industry. And there's a part in there called a drive shell, or a, a sun shell is the other name for it. And they've been breaking in that transmission for. 30 years. Transmission was invented in 1982 as the 700 R4, and it just graduated. But they've been breaking for years, and the symptoms are always the same. There's no reverse, no second gear, no fourth gear, every single time. And if the oil is nice and cherry red, that's really all that's broken in the transmission. In this other one, they said, oh, we're going to have to take it out to find out what's wrong with it. Have you never worked on a 4L60 before? Yeah, they've never rebuilt one, but they're the... These things all have the same pattern of failure. They don't have to take it apart to tell you what's wrong with it. That's just a trick because once your car is up eight foot in the air, your engine is supported by chains, and your frame is dropped out from underneath, and your transmission is spread across this fancy bench, it's going to get expensive, maybe more than you bargained yeah. for. Well, you know, my, my rant this week, Dave, <laughs> is about reviews. We had a customer. She came to us, needed some work. You know, we did some diagnosis to find out what a noise was. And came up with a solution. That solution was sixteen or seventeen hundred dollars or something like that. Well, that wasn't. That was too much. She she wasn't happy about that. She shopped around, did some phone call shopping, shopped around, and, and shopped at one of our good local competitors. And and then called back and said, Nah, you know, it's this much. So okay, but you have to understand that seven hundred dollars or eight hundred dollars they ended up being or whatever it was. That's not what we're doing for sixteen hundred dollars. So there's this perception that you were trying to charge me double what I got the work done somewhere else. And then you go write a review about it. Well, it's just not true. I promise you that shop A didn't do what shop B was going to do for 1600 for 700 It just doesn't work. But the part that gets me the most about this is after I wrote, looked at my review that wasn't so stellar, did, she did say some nice things. Then I went and looked because I assumed that she wrote a review for the other shop. She did. But what I found most interesting, she did write a nice review just last week, but 18 months ago, she wrote that same shop a great review. She was lucky to find them, and, and, and they're a good shop. So my question that I asked to her, why did you come to me? She already, had, she already had a great relationship. She already the whole, had their trust and yeah, everything like that. That's she, the whole thing we talk about, Dave. If you have a good shop, that is the, one of the most important relationships, you know, your, your doctor, your dentist, your mechanic. If you have one, keep one. I, I just wish for her sake and for our sake, actually, she was just stayed there. Yeah, not, not shop hopping. No, just stay there. It would have, it would have been better for both of us. No I wouldn't have had a bad review. Like right. She wouldn't have spent a you know 150 extra dollars having the car looked at by us, and, and, it, and it just it just would have been better. So really, just stay there. But again, there's the thing too. You have to ask and know to make an apples to apples comparison. In hindsight, we could have done exactly what they did for about the same price. I think we were 40 or 50 bucks more, maybe half as much stuff though. No, we could have done, yeah, yeah, no, the 700 wasn't the 1600, but we could have done the 700 solution too. That just wasn't our first recommendation. For sure. So a lot of subjectivity. We all need to have discussions about this and find a home and stay there. For sure. Well, up for some stagnant middle. Wow, it's a rough tongue day. We've got Dale in Scottsdale on an Impala. Go ahead, Dale. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, good morning, gentlemen. I'm trying to avoid shredding my engine. Um, I have a 2006 Chevy Impala. It's got 190,000 on it. I bought it when it had 160, so that's the history. Got an intermittent check engine light. Um, I ordered a CarMD.com device, and the code says it's a timing chain. 
If we assume that's correct, how likely it is, is it for a timing chain to break? And if it did, is it going to do substantial damage to the engine? Uh, first thing I was thinking right off the bat, there isn't a code for a timing chain specifically. So is it another code there that maybe... Maybe we do we would that we whittle down to thinking we have a timing chain issue. That, that that's the only code that's showing up. Okay. And and then I went on the online and they said that's the timing chain code and I didn't have time to get it. I didn't. I've never listened to you guys. My guys should. I I'm enjoying the show a lot. Well, Dale, you just added to our rant. Dave. <laughs> I know, Dale, you might get us fired up even more. Um, you know, the thing is that there, we want you to follow up with us. On email for sure, please at bumper to bumper radio dot com. We've been Dave and I have been thinking about buying one of these car MD devices and then running that against the reality. But like Dave said, there is not a code that says you have a bad timing chain. It, it's nope. not possible. It doesn't happen. I had a lady call the other day. Well, we put an auction center because the code said it was an auction center. No, it didn't. No, it did not. That's what the guy in the parking lot at the parts store. I don't, you know, I don't want to be cynical about it. I don't think there's that they're designed to sell parts and, and whatever. That's their business. But the code is likely could be a timing a timing synchronization or a phase code that the camshaft and the crankshaft are out of spec are out of phase with each other. And in that case it could be a timing chain. There's a sensor on the camshaft, a sensor on the crankshaft. Those need to rotate within a certain number of degrees of each other that's programmed in the computer. When they get off, you could have a bad sensor. You could have a bad timing chain. That will also allow them. So, yes, it's at 190,000 miles. Very it's, possible. It's very possible and very likely, if that car has a timing chain, that very likely it is stretched or worn out. So to answer your question, timing chains usually don't break. It, very, it could, depending on how it broke or the design of the engine, cause engine damage to the valve, similar to when a timing belt breaks. Some of those are designed like that. Some of them aren't. It's not a common failure, so it's not something that we would know off the top of our head. But again, it's, there's no code for a timing chain. Well, now I've got a 2006 Chevrolet Impala. I'm going to put myself in his shoes. It's got 190,000 miles on it. Do I go in there and just replace a timing chain? Or am I thinking, well, hey, maybe I do want to keep the car. Maybe I'm thinking about going to a different engine altogether. Well, I don't know. I mean, I guess you could. I guess it would depend on what the cost of a timing chain is. And then you'd have to spend a little bit of money maybe doing a leak down test or a compression test to find out the health of that engine. Uh, if it's not burning oil or anything, I wouldn't see anything wrong with fixing that. But, again, it needs an inspection. This is a perfect example. Ring, ring. How much for a timing chain on my Impala? Now, I'm not mm. suggesting this is what Dale's doing, so don't take this wrong, Dale. Oh, timing chain. Oh, look it up. Get in the book. A couple clicks on the computer. Oh, the timing chain labor. Uh, Going to have to do an oil change. Gallon of coolant. Uh, 1500 bucks. I just made that number up. Well, you were just out of shop, but I'm calling from... They told me 2500 Those guys are ripping me off. No, the water pump we included. This is what I'm getting at. If you're going to make this kind of repair, maybe you're going to think about replacing the water pumps. Instead of putting the old one back on, you want to put a new one on. Maybe you, since you just bought this car, you're probably going to keep it. You're going to put a timing belt. I mean, put a, put a serpentine belt. Maybe a belt tensioner. Maybe replace the thermostat while you're there in a bypass hose. See the difference now? There's so much subjectivity in auto repair. And you have to have discussions and talk about things when people are telling you you need something to understand. We always encourage you, get a relationship, maintain the relationship, and ask questions. Get involved in your auto repair and understand what it is that you're getting and what it is that's happening with your car. Well, up first this segment, we've got Tim with a 1996 Toyota Avalon. Go ahead, Tim. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yes. Uh, my question is twofold. Um, my father owns the Avalon, and it's got a little over 200,000 miles on it, and it needed emissions uh, this year, uh, this month, for his tag renewal, and the check engine light was on. So, of course, when they took, he took it in for emissions, they said, well, you got to get your check engine light off and come back. So he took it in, have it looked at, and they determined it's, the, I guess, the oxygen sensor, and um, which I think is a common problem. So the first part of my question is, is what's the best questions to ask when shopping around to get that replaced? The initial place 
he took it to said sixteen hundred dollars because they have to take a lot of stuff apart, which kind of surprises me because it seems like a common uh, problem. And then the second thing is, is when he he went ahead and got a waiver, so um, he got his car registered. Uh, but he'll have to get it. The problem eventually fixed if he wants to re-register it later. And um, it seems to me like when they did the when they gave him the waiver and when they did the emissions test to qualify for the waiver, they never did tell him what his actual emissions were. Um, and so that was just a curiosity of mine. On on um, you know even though this this light is coming on saying he's got a bad sensor. Um, I'm wondering if his emissions still were within range and, and why they wouldn't tell him what right, they actually I were. When I, when I hear O2 sensor and I hear $1,600, I'm thinking we're immediately talking about the wrong repair. The code may have been related to an O2 sensor. That was the O2 sensor code, but the cause for the code may have been you know, something more major like a bad head gasket or I don't know. Well, it could be cal- Toyota's catalytic common, converters. Catalytic converters. There's reprogramming problems, but his question was what was the best way to shop around Mm-hmm. And what what are the questions to ask? So I think one of the first questions you could say, or if I, if I was going to ask somebody, I'd say, "Wow, sixteen hundred seems like a lot of money. Aren't oxygen sensors about two hundred and fifty dollars?" Because I am confident. I this is the same deal I was talking about with that review. They're not. I, I'm pretty darn sure. I'm willing to bet a paycheck on it. Almost. They are not charging you sixteen hundred dollars for an oxygen sensor. There's some other, st- or the labor for one oxygen sensor. That car is a V6, I'm sure. It probably has four oxygen sensors. In Toyota, like Subaru, they actually call theirs, in some cases, an air-fuel ratio sensor. They can be expensive. You might have four of them at $300 each. There's $1,200, bucks, 150 200 bucks to diagnose it, run through all the testing. And then those oxygen sensors are not hard necessary to replace. They may be difficult to access. So I, I don't think that you that the shop possibly didn't do a good enough job of explaining to you what you're getting for your money, or you didn't quite understand it. So I guess the question would be how how what is the, what is the problem? What is it, what is the one thing or the singular thing that needs to be fixed? And then are we adding something else to it? Well, I think too to go down and, and it's not something you're going to get over the phone if he's going to call around and be asking. You know, what's your price on this? What's your price on this? What's your price on that? You really have to understand the repair uh, in order to in order to be able to do that. So someone's going to have to thoroughly explain to you what they're doing and, and why and why it costs, and they'd be happy to justify their price. And, and we all are happy to justify our price. When somebody says, "Wow, 1,600 bucks is expensive," you know what I say? I totally agree with you. It is expensive. Yeah, but it's me, a lot of money. Let me tell you what has to happen to do that and what what kind of man labor and what kind of componentry has to go with it. And you could have it and somebody could replace an oxygen sensor that's a hundred dollars less, but guess what? This is the one that doesn't have the the bulk you know, the factory connector on it, so they're using crimping wires that are supposed to be soldered and half the time we see those they aren't done right. And so again, it's not it may or may not be an apples to apples comparison. The second part of this question was, you know, now that I got the waiver uh, they can't tell me how it what it actually what the emissions is what it produces and they don't they don't even sniff the tailpipe anymore because the car is doing the sniffing for them on so a 1996 and newer that car and we we were going to talk about that coming up but but that the other thing with that um, that they're not measuring the tail they're not measuring what's coming out the tailpipe I bet if you put that 1996 car and applied the 1994 Four standards, which they are sniffing the tailpipe. It probably passed. Fifty-fifty chance. I mean, my my uh, my made-up statistics, like like we like seventy percent of all statistics are made up just before they're given. <laughs> <laughs> just like that one. It probably would have passed, but just not on the standards that apply to that car. Well, thanks so much for the call, Tim. We've got Gina in Phoenix on a 1989 S10 Blazer. Go ahead, Gina. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Yes, this is a mission thing. I haven't taken it yet because my exhaust system fell off the, a few months ago. I've been taking my mother's car because she works different hours than me. I work um, shift work, so it's hard to get there early. So um, what are your ideas? I mean, I'm afraid to take it because it's being held up by wires. I, ran into, I went to the yellow oh. zone to get a new battery because it died since I haven't been driving it. So I put a, um, went up there and everybody's looking at it because it's like an inch off the ground. I was I had to coast to the auto zone. 
And so one guy hooked it up with wires so it's drivable. But, you know, he gives me his car. And I'm very suspicious about someone in the parking lot who gives me a car and say, yeah, yeah I can fix it for this much. Yeah, we've heard scams about that. You know, the little old lady in the parking lot at Walmart that is told there's something wrong with her car. D- don't Don't go that route. Gina, if that exhaust system is not leaking, they should be able to test the car. That doesn't mean it's going to pass. You could have other issues. But if there's, if the exhaust, if, if the muffler's got a hole in it or there's not all the exhaust coming out the tailpipe that dilutes the measurement and they will be sniffing, so to speak, the tailpipe on an 89 Blazer, so the integrity of the exhaust system has to be good. Being held up by wires or anything like that is not a problem unless it interferes with them putting the, the, the hose over the tailpipe. So maybe you could just go to a muffler shop and say, can I get to emissions or can, what can you do? Show me as little as possible just so I can at least make sure I can go get my test. Don't spend a whole lot of money until you get your test. Get the test. Find out if you passed and then, and, and then decide which where you need to spend your money. An 89 Blazer, you might fail. Um, you know, so you just ha- you just have to go get the test. You do get a free retest. And the other thing, if you want to go to servicearizona.com, that's the DMV website, you can go there before you go to emissions. They have cameras. It shows how many people are in line and what the weight is. So you won't have to go wait for two hours anymore. You can pick. By the time I get there, the whole situation <laughs> always changes. So thanks for the call, Gina. Let's go with Justin in surprise on a 2013 Jeep Wrangler. Go ahead, Justin. You're on Bumper to Bumper. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my my uh, question is, uh, my Jeep is calling for um, 5W20 for the uh, oil, and um, I just always thought, you know, I always would like the 5W30, and uh, my question is, is that so much of a uh, difference in the new Pentstar engine, and if that would hurt, um, you know, any warranty or any issues like that, if I was to go with uh, 530 when it calls for a 520? That's well, my question. Thank yeah, you. They, you're welcome. Good question. Uh, every time, I mean, there's so many questions with that have to do with oil that uh, we could do whole shows about. But I don't know what your preference to 530 is. The car likes 520, though, and and the the, the manufacturer. It, in all likelihood, it probably wouldn't hurt it. Follow the rules because on the oils, there are so many choices, so many different things, and really anymore, and, and Really, for fuel economy, going from a 520 to a 530 would change. I mean, the yeah. car was was tested with 520. Yeah. And it, we had the oil guy here, and he says, you know, people are just, you know, we, we were all raised with things our grandfather told us or our dad told us. Oh, yeah, you know, out here in Arizona, it's out ultra hot. You know, you want the little thicker oil. Um, any more of these things, the engineering has come down so much more tight. It, the, the tolerances are tight. The, the, the standards are tight. We have to forget the stuff that, our parents knew. It doesn't apply anymore. There's people out there running shops that are stuck in the 1980s. Yeah. Don't, it's old news. We don't put brake fluid in transmissions anymore. We don't put, you know, thicker oil in to make it, you know, you don't go buy the additive off the shelf because that stuff is old news. St- stick with what's in the, what it says on the oil cap or in the owner's manual. I think the 520 is a couple bucks more than the 530, and, and maybe it wants a synthetic. Follow the guidelines, probably a 3,700-mile oil change on that. Stick with it. Especially that's Fiat now. We don't know how when, they're going to play. Yeah, that's the Pinstar. It used to be Dahmer, Dahmer Chrysler, you know. So there might be – we don't know how they're going to play, how they're going to look at the American market when you didn't put the right oil in there and, and how they might spank you one day if you have a problem. Chances are it wouldn't hurt it, but stick with what they want. Well, our emissions question that I had planned out was from an email. A gentleman has a 2004 Ford Explorer. I just went right, right down the wrong path here. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, someone had a check engine light on. They bought one of those code reader, scanner, clear check engine lighter, turner off or things. WebMD. WebMD. Bought one of those, turned out the check engine light because they know if the check engine light is on, you can't pass emissions. So the check engine light turned it off, went down to emissions, and failed. And he wants to know why he failed emissions. He, he was wondering if he was out of line for raising cane with the guys at the emission station because <laughs> the light wasn't on. Well, as Dave said, the car is doing the sniffing when we were talking about the 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 the, uh, the other one. The, the car is always doing the self-test. So on a 1996 or newer car, if your check engine light is illuminated, you fail. If it doesn't come on when you turn the key on, as have bulb check, fail. So what he did, he went and he turned the light off. Lights off, I passed, right? Wrong. 
the car is always doing its own test. There's seven or eight systems, depending on the car, where it's always doing a self-test of these systems, and it's called readiness monitors. Once it can do six or eight or seven of, of the eight tests, depending on the year, it, it then says, okay, we're good, and it, and it completes the monitors. There's one for the catalytic converter where it's using the oxygen sensors to measure. Once it sees what it likes, what it's programmed in, that one's cleared. There's one for the evaporative system. One for the evap. That's one. the hard one to get to reset. Yeah, temperatures, a lot of variables, the fuel level, the, the ambient temperature. And we can actually see it when we plug into a car. We can check the readiness monitors and see which tests were done and which tests were complete. But the evap system is basically the air tightness of the fuel system, and it, it can only run at certain times before it's going to be ready. And they allow you to have two readiness monitors that aren't ready, correct? Yeah, one or two. It depends on the air, and I, you know, it's hard to keep up with a lot of this stuff. But the point is, you, <laughs> there's no circumventing the system. They've, they've kind of got this figured out. The, the government does, the feds and the, the emissions people. It's designed to, to, not, to not cheat. You, you, just, it's, you can't get away with it. Back in the old days, we used to be able to unplug a fuel injector or put in denatured alcohol or do all this other monkey business that, that just doesn't apply anymore. Up first this segment, let's go with Paul in Mesa on a 2000 F-150. Go ahead, Paul. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning. How you guys doing? Doing great. Thank you. Um, okay, I got a, a, a 2000 F-150. Uh, I bought it brand new, and uh, I've done all the maintenance, 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 maintenance. I'm on top of it. My question is, how many miles am I going to get out of my transmission? 2000? I'm, I'm at 210,000. Well, you know, I have seen that particular transmission go... 300,000 miles. It's rare. 200,000 miles, you're, you're at the top, so the maintenance certainly does help, but more than likely, that's a 4R70 or 4R75W. And I do see them go 200,000 miles, but, you know, I just keep after it, you know, keep keep maintenance in it. Obviously, I mean, the less you just gun it right out the line and do your little jackrabbit starts, the better. Gentle. The less the less you throw that thing in the park when you're still going three miles an hour, the better. Uh, <laughs> well, um, ADS, Automotive Diagnostic Specialty, is one of the bumper-to-bumper shops, one of the many great shops. You'll find it at bumper-to-bumper-radio.com. Greg, we were having a conversation with Greg. He does He handles a fleet of Ford vans, and they've been using only synthetic oil in the engines and the transmissions. And I could have sworn that's probably around this same model year. It's the same style chassis, a van, you know, an E or an F. He was getting two fifty three hundred thousand on fleets, and you know these guys oh, are. Oh yeah, they drive it like it's stolen when it's not your own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you, you know, still, you know, you still. I mean, you're you're up there. You've beat the law of averages for sure on that transmission, but it doesn't mean it won't keep going. Because I mean, I, there there is some anomalies out there, you know. But the service definitely helps, and Greg's seen it with his fleets. We've talked in depth about that. So be nice, rub the shifter once in a while, talk nicely to it, push its overdrive button now and then. And the other thing I tell people, you know, I see people have the thing in overdrive and just go up the hills you know when you're going up the hills the transmission is doing all kinds of hunting third gear fourth gear third gear fourth gear third gear fourth gear just take it out of overdrive go a little go a little slower and stay in third gear going up you know you're driving up the rim or whatever it may be so anything you can do that will certainly increase the life of your transmission not to have extra use but keep up the good work that's for sure for sure. Well, let's go with Doug in Mesa on a 2003 Daewoo. Go ahead, Doug. You're on Bumper to Bumper. Hey, yeah, man. I've talked to you guys a couple times about this car. It's been sitting, I tell you, it's been sitting for like four or five years and told me to put in those, uh, you know, those fuel, you know, chemicals. And the only way I can get this thing to go for like 10 seconds if I, if I uh, you know, hit, put starter fluid in the air filter thing. Okay. Well, it sounds like it's, I mean, so I, your, I think your question is why won't my car start or? Yeah, well, what do I got to do? I mean, you guys told me to put in uh, like five gallons of gas in it, premium fuel. I did all that stuff. I put in uh, uh, Lucas, uh, you know, their, what do they call it, injection cleaner. Okay. I put in stable in there. Nothing to get this thing to get this thing on. But if I take a. A couple, you know, give it a couple fast sprays of uh, of a starter fluid. It'll, it'll run for, you know, ten seconds. Okay. Well, what that's telling me is that there's no fuel getting to the engine, and you're artificially injecting the fuel, which is starting fluid. 
probably the context, and I don't remember telling you that, but probably the context of that, the car had been sitting, now I need to get it started, what should I do? Put some fuel in. Well, adding fuel and adding additives won't fix broken components. But by you injecting the fuel, that tells us the car has spark. It's got mechanically, it's good enough to at least run. You've got to figure out why the engine is not delivering any fuel to the car. Does it not have fuel in, fuel pressure or does it not have fuel injector pulse? So you're going to need a tool, you're going to need a manual, or you're going to need somebody that has the tools and the manual and the knowledge. We need to check the fuel pressure. If it doesn't have fuel pressure, then we need to find out why. Is there no power to the pump? If there's not power to the pump, is it the relay? If there is power to the pump, we have a bad pump probably. So you need some testing. No more additives, no more stuff in the tank won't do anything. Well, thanks for the call, Doug. We're going to go with Darren here pretty quickly, and we're going to get, uh, looks like, Craig and Richard off air. So go ahead, Darren. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Got a 1996 Saturn SC, and recently it started making a rattling noise in the front. When I popped the hood, the fan radiator assembly seems to shake violently about four or five seconds every time I turn the key off. Is that like normal wear and tear, or is that something I need to get into a shop? But my engine's about to fall apart. So the radiator fan, the plastic fan assembly, just after you shut the engine off, is shaking by itself? Are the blades moving still? or? I believe the, the blades are winding down at the time. And all the blades are actually there. There's not one missing? It does not appear to be. I mean, it's got this metal or this uh, grating over it. It makes it hard to see. But when I spin it, I thought I counted every blade. Now, the other thing is, are all the mounting bolts good? I'm thinking when it shuts off, maybe it's a little rough right there. Yeah, the, I mean, we see mounting bolts. could the, That fan shroud assembly holds the fan. Sometimes you can service the fan separately, or sometimes it's the fan and the housing, the, the whole assembly. I would be looking for that coming apart. Maybe there's something loose. Oftentimes they're mounted on rubber bushings that, um, you know, that are there to dampen the vibration. It shouldn't, I mean, violently shaking. I, I wouldn't think that would be normal. There definitely is something going on you know, there. And, and there's, um, you're in Chandler, Frank Lloyd's at Desert Car Care. We were just talking about Greg at ADS. That's one of those things where probably if that's in your neighborhood and you're coming home from work and it's not five minutes before they're closing, you could probably pull up and say, hey, I think I might have a problem. Would you mind come out and look? Do, I, do you see anything here? Do you, is there anything that you can see or do I need to leave this so we can get it up and get it in the air and, and, and check it out. 